Our speaker today is one who's familiar, I'm sure, to a lot of you. Elaine Mills trained as a master gardener in 2012 and has been growing native plants in her shady back garden for over 10 years and at our Glen Carlin demonstration garden, where she has been a coordinator since 2017. She took the photographs in today's presentation at these locations as well as at other public gardens. And without further ado, welcome Elaine. Thank you very much, Colleen. Welcome everyone to another presentation in our sustainable landscaping series. Today, I'll be introducing you to quite a few native plants for shade. And as Colleen mentioned, I'll be sharing many photographs, which I hope will be inspiring to you should you uh, want to include any of these in your own home landscape. We'll begin this morning by talking about the benefits of shade gardening. And then I'd like to move on to discuss briefly several concepts for planting in shade. These include determining light levels, creating understory layers beneath trees, and building woodland soil. Then the greater part of the presentation will involve an introduction to the best bets plants for shade, all the way from the understory trees down to ground covers. And we'll stop at several points to take your questions. And then we'll wind things up by discussing some resources. And this will include an explanation of where you might see native plants and where you might buy them. Many local jurisdictions are encouraging folks to plant more trees on their properties to help build the canopy. And we now know that trees offer us many services. Of course, they're most obviously offering relief from the increasing summer heat we're experiencing with climate change, but they provide many other services. They capture and sequester carbon. They provide the oxygen that we breathe, of course. The uh, canopy can help subdue the strong pressure of heavy rainfall and the roots of trees can uh, take up that rainfall and somewhat mitigate flooding. In addition, the leaves can help filter out pollutants from the air. We have many other woody and herbaceous native plants that grow very well in the shade beneath those trees. And those shade tolerant plants in turn are going to support much of our wildlife, the pollinators, the birds and other small animals. And another bonus to gardening in shade is that shady landscapes require minimal weeding and watering. In order to talk about what plants you'll want to put in your garden, we should talk about what are referred to as degrees of shade. And when we talk about that, we're discussing the number of hours of sun that plants will be receiving. So partial shade is less than four hours of direct sun a day, and the site will not receive any hot afternoon sun. Full shade is less than two hours of direct sun a day, and trees or structures will cast shadows or block the sun. Dense shade means that there is no direct sunlight, and this will occur under very densely foliaged deciduous trees, under evergreen trees and shrubs, or beneath decks, and the ground here is going to be very dry and dark. Another aspect of shade is dappled shade. And here, sun is filtered through the leaves and branches of deciduous trees all day, and you're not going to have any searing sunbeams. And finally, there is edge shade that's found at the boundary of woodlands. In addition to this, there is what we refer to as seasonal shade. For example, here in our uh, quarry shade demonstration garden, you'll see filtered sunlight in early spring. And this is before the leaf canopy really begins to leaf out. But then as it does, the canopy will close in and the conditions will be darker and the soil will become drier. 
in any landscape, it's very important to think about layers, both uh, from an ornamental point of view and from an ecosystem point of view. And this is especially important in our shade gardens, where because we're talking about plants growing under trees, we can have as many as five different layers, canopy, mid-story, understory trees, shrubs, and then finally the plants that are in the ground cover layer. And just as one example, in this graphic, we see how bird species use varied layers for their nesting and foraging. And the use of those layers may change with the seasons. For example, birds may go to the ground to find worms, to collect nesting materials. Then a little bit later, they may go up into the woody plants and be looking for caterpillars to bring to their nestlings for food. Later in the season, they may go to the herbaceous plants on the ground level to look for seeds, then to the shrub level for berries. I'm assuming if you already have a shade garden that you have one or more of either the canopy or the mid-story trees that are listed here. So you'll want to make use of those to begin your shade garden. And you can continue by adding understory trees. These are going to be in the 20 to 25 foot tall range. They're going to be tolerant of reduced light levels. You'll want to site these very carefully because obviously they're going to be long lived members of your garden community. Now, if you have a very small residential landscape, these understory trees may actually be the tallest level in your garden. And then beneath that, you'll want to add a layer of shrubs. These are multi-stemmed plants. They can range anywhere from three feet tall, even up to 15 or 20 feet tall. And then finally, you'll fill in with vines and various herbaceous plants that are all going to be under four feet tall. Another aspect of gardening in shade is to talk about the quality of the soil. And a shaded habitat should really mimic woodland soil. That means that if the existing soil is compacted, you'll want to loosen it gently around the tree roots and then add plenty of organic matter, whether it be compost, leaf mold, or aged bark that will help over time disintegrate and make the soil more friable. Another very important concept in the fall is to leave the leaves. This is a very natural process of recycling nutrients for our trees. The leaf litter will provide insulation for the soil and prevent erosion. And we're now learning more and more how this important leaf litter offers overwintering habitat for insects such as bumblebees, our Lepidoptera, the butterflies, moths, and fritillaries, and lightning bugs. Now, I'd like to invite you to turn to the handout which we've provided for you. Uh, you'll be able to follow along. I'm going to be introducing you to quite a few plants, so I'm going to be moving at a fairly good clip. But every bit of information that I'm sharing, whether it's describing the plants or explaining their care, is repeated if you follow the links for each of the plants, you'll be taken in most cases to what we refer to as a tried and true plant fact sheet. In a couple of cases where we don't have those, we'll take you to another uh, very uh, reputable source. You'll also notice that some of the plants are followed by an asterisk. And because concern about deer predation is so important, I've marked the more deer resistant plants with that asterisk. So we'll begin now with the understory trees, and I'll be describing these in order from tallest to shortest. So the first of these is American hornbeam, Carpinus caroliniana. This is really just about the most adaptable of our native trees. In North America, it's found all the way from Canada to Florida and Texas, and then even as far as Honduras in Central America. It has a globular shape, often with multiple trunks, ranging from 20 to 35 feet high. It, of course, likes part to full shade. 
moist, rich, acidic soil and will even tolerate flooding. Unfortunately, this is one of the plants where the deer may eat leaves and twigs. It provides excellent nesting in the forked branches and the dense crown. You'll see these catkins in the spring and then later nutlets will form and these provide great food for breeding songbirds and our spring migrants. American hornbeam is a larval host for butterflies and it takes on an attractive yellow fall color. One of its outstanding features is the trunk with distinctive muscle-like fluting and this combined with a very attractive silhouette provides great winter interest. So American hornbeam is a great tree for providing transition from that canopy level down to the shrub level. Another great understory tree is fringe tree, Cyanthus virginicus, found from southern Pennsylvania all the way through the southeast and in all regions of Virginia. This is a slow growing tree with multiple trunks, as you can see pictured there, again 20 to 35 feet tall. This is a dioecious species that means that there will be separate trees for male and female plants. It can grow all the way from sun to full shade. Here it's pictured as a street tree in my neighborhood. It likes moist soil and be alert that deer may damage the tree. It provides good understory shelter. Fringe tree will put out leaves in the late spring and these will provide nourishment for the sphinx moth caterpillar. Right now here in the third week in April, I'm beginning to see these fragrant flowers. They can last all the way into early June and those will attract native bees. The flowers on the male tree are said to be showier. I haven't been able to see the trees side by side to compare. I think both of them are lovely. Then olive-like fruit will form on pollinated female trees, and you'll see this fruit that's enjoyed by the birds. Another tree, of course, that will connect the canopy to the shrub layer. Eastern redbud, Cirsus canadensis, is very popular here in Northern Virginia. In fact, you see it planted so frequently, I think many people may not even realize that it is in fact a native tree. This is found throughout much of Eastern North America, particularly in the mountains and Piedmont region of Virginia. Eastern redbud has a short trunk and an umbrella-like crown reaching anywhere from 15 to 30 feet tall. This unfortunately is a somewhat short-lived tree. When I had one, it didn't last particularly long. This tree can grow all the way from a sun to full shade. It flowers best in full sun or on woodland edges, but it does tolerate the shade of the canopy. It likes moist soil, tolerates clay soil, and even black walnut. But again, deer may damage this tree. Eastern red bud will put out pea-like blossoms from April to May, and these are a wonderful early pollen and nectar source for our bees. Now, one interesting facet of the flowering is what's referred to as coliflory, and that means that these buds can actually emerge directly from the trunk or the branches rather than little twig tips. Eastern redbud has heart-shaped leaves with smooth edges, and they will provide nourishment for various Lepidoptera. Now, you may notice from time to time these little semicircular cuts that are made in some of the leaves. These are made by leafcutter bees, native bees that will take these small sections of leaf, wrap them up with uh, the eggs for the young and a pollen ball, and that occurs in the spring while they're doing their nesting. This will create a small amount of cosmetic damage, but it won't destroy the tree by any means. Then later in the season, you'll see the seed pods forming. They'll last on into December, providing food for birds. Eastern redbud is a really colorful understory tree, especially effective when planted in groves, should you have the room for that. 
Another wonderful understory tree, our state tree of Virginia, is flowering dogwood, Cornus, Florida. This is found throughout the Mid-Atlantic region and in fact, much of Eastern North America. It grows with graceful horizontal branching. It reaches 15 to 30 feet in height. And it particularly prefers growing in part shade and shade is especially important in the afternoon. It's going to like moist, organically rich, acidic soil. It can tolerate clay soil and black walnut, but be alert that deer may severely damage it. Now, many people have concerns about planting a dogwood because of the disease anthracnose that they've heard about. But I've recently learned that there are two types of anthracnose. The systemic a damaging anthracnose occurs on trees that are planted at higher elevations. So that's going to be more in the, the mountainous region in Virginia, for example. When trees are planted in the Piedmont or a coastal plain, they're more likely to be susceptible to what's called spot anthracnose. So that's going to cause cosmetic damage, but not to kill the tree. And one thing you can do to try to mitigate this is to really pay attention to the fact that this is an understory tree and plant it in part shade. You can also make sure you're providing moist, organically rich soil and provide extra supplemental water in times of drought so it will not create additional stress for the tree. Flowering dogwood, of course, is recognized for its showy petal-like bracts, either the creamy white or pink. And these surround the fairly insignificant true flowers that are visited by specialist bees for pollen. All of the dogwood trees have leaves with these curving veins. The flowering dogwood serves as a larval host for the spring azure butterfly. Of course, flowering dogwood is also recognized for its bright fall foliage and wonderful fruits for wintering birds. The horizontal branches of this particular tree create a really nice contrast with the vertical trunks of the canopy. Another native dogwood is pagoda dogwood, Cornus alternifolia. This is found throughout Eastern North America in Virginia here in Northern Virginia and in the mountainous region. Another flat top tree with that horizontal branching in tiers. It reaches anywhere from 15 to 25 feet in height. It's going to prefer part to full shade, again, moist acidic soil. It can tolerate poor soils and clay and deer may occasionally severely damage it. This tree provides wonderful cover for wildlife and nesting for birds. Pagoda dogwood, unlike the other dogwoods in the Cornus genus, has alternate leaves. That's where this species name, Alternifolia, uh, comes in. These leaves may actually seem whirled at the tips. And this tree will provide nourishment for the spring azure butterfly again. This also has a lovely maroon fall color. Pagoda dogwood has flat, fragrant clusters of flowers in May, attracting many pollinators, including a specialist bee. And when those are pollinated, it results in this lovely nutritious fruit in June for up to 43 bird species. And when all that fruit has been eaten, you'll see these interesting lingering red fruit stalks. Pagoda dogwood is really a tree with high wildlife value for the understory level. Moving down in height, we see downy serviceberry, Amelanchier arborea. This grows all the way from Maine to Virginia, throughout all the regions of Virginia, and then in scattered locations in the southeast and somewhat uh, toward the west. This is a multi-stem tree, 15 to 25 feet in height. It can grow in sun, but uh, does very well in part shade. It likes moist soil, tolerates clay, even dry soil and pollution. And luckily, deer seldom severely damage it. This is a larval host for quite a few species of caterpillars, 124. 
Downey serviceberry has early spring flowers, which provide a wonderful nectar source for our native bees. And it is the first of the native trees to fruit that will happen in May. And the fruit is edible both by humans and birds. Then moving through the season, you'll see a beautiful, brilliant fall color and lovely dappled bark. One alert is that you may want to avoid planting this tree if you have cedars nearby. Having these two trees in close proximity means that they are alternating hosts of what's referred to as cedar apple rust. Now, the way it manifests on the downy service berry is there will be an unsightly orange growth on the fruit. It won't kill the tree, but it just will not be that attractive. Downy service berry is really a lovely small tree, sometimes referred to as a large shrub with true four season interest. And the last of our understory trees is Sweet Bay Magnolia, Magnolia virginiana. This is a coastal species growing from New Jersey all the way to Louisiana and is found in the coastal plain in Virginia. Depending on the habitat where it's growing, it can either be evergreen to semi-evergreen. It's multi-stemmed with a lovely rounded crown and reaches 12 to 30 feet in height. This is another tree that can grow in the sun, but does quite well in part shade. And this tree is going to prefer moist to wet, very rich acidic soil. It tolerates some occasional flooding air pollution, and even some salt spray. And there are varying reports on its deer resistance. Sweet Bay Magnolia has lovely lemon-scented flowers, and they're going to provide nectar and pollen for our pollinators from May to June. And the shiny green foliage will be a nourishment for our swallowtail butterflies and moths. When the flowers are pollinated, that will result in these cone-like fruits that mature in late summer. And then wildlife will be able to enjoy these bright seeds. Sweet Bay Magnolia also has this lovely, smooth, lightly scented bark. This is a particularly attractive tree for patio areas. Before I want to close and move to our question and answers here, I want to give you a few quick tips on landscaping under trees. First of all, you'll want to remove any invasive plants. And when you begin planting beneath your already established trees, you want to use care to avoid damaging their roots. Most of the roots of our large trees are really just located within the top maybe 18 inches of soil. And the roots of those trees can actually reach out even beyond what's referred to as the drip line, the outer edges of the branches. So you want to be very careful when planting around them. You definitely do not want to pile soil on top of any exposed tree roots in order to do the planting. You could use, if you wish, thin layers of wood chips or mulch, even allowing, as we discussed a few moments ago, that leaf litter to collect. But you don't want any of this mulching layer to touch the trunk of the tree. That can cause moisture to gather there and create a rot. When you begin planting underneath the trees, you want to install shrubs when they are small, or you can even use the plug size of plants. And be aware that when you're planting under the trees, the soil is going to be more dry. So you'll want to choose the more drought uh, tolerant specimens. Before we move to questions, I just want to mention that on your handout, I listed several other trees in the understory level that you may want to consider. And if you follow the links to those, you'll be able to learn a lot more about them. And luckily, all three of those are fairly deer resistant. Colleen, do we have any questions at this point? Yeah. Yes, we do, Elaine. The first one was a question about strategy. If you have a situation where you've just planted some young shade trees and they haven't gotten big enough to actually give you shade. And the same person asked about a situation where their shade trees are dying out. 
Do you have any strategies for those two situations? Okay. I actually established my so-called forested area in my backyard by putting in small trees. And now, 15 or 20 years later, they've grown up into that canopy. So I actually added some of the smaller understory trees that could tolerate a little more sun early on. But I guess if you're concerned that you don't have much shade yet, you may need to wait just a, a little bit. You could begin by creating beds, wider beds at the foot of each of those trees that you've installed and begin adding those shady layers underneath them. Then as those branches reach out, you could extend the, the depth of the beds until eventually they may meet. Now, if you have trees that are dying out, I guess you just need to work really carefully. You might want to actually consult with a certified arborist to double check on the condition, see whether maybe just some branches or a part of those trees needs to be removed. If the entire tree needs to be removed, you may want to do that before you begin any planting underneath because heavy work underneath those trees could damage anything that you've already tried to put underneath it. Another questioner very nicely bought a red bud for a friend a couple of years ago, and it has yet to flower. Is that abnormal? That does sound unusual. Some plants just take a while before flowering. I've seen in my neighborhood even fairly young trees that people have put along the curbside. They're not particularly tall, and they seem to be flowering at a fairly short height. So I'm not sure if there's maybe some adverse conditions. Trees don't do well when they're planted in the middle of a lawn. That's because trees tend to like more acidic soil and our turf grass prefers more alkaline soil. And especially if any chemicals or fertilizers are applied to the lawn, that could be damaging as well. If there's any spraying, use of pesticides. So it, not knowing the exact circumstances, these are just a few yeah. possibilities that I'm throwing out. Another questioner is concerned. They have leaves in their yard, but they sometimes clump and they're worried that it will kill the ground cover. They wonder if they should sort of break up the clumps and scatter them or if it's not a worry. That might be a good idea. You definitely don't want the leaf litter to be collecting so deep that it's up against the trunk of the tree. Now, there's a kind of a fine balance that you may want to walk. And this is discussed particularly in a presentation you can find on our website called Leave the Leaves. You want to try to retain that leaf litter as a protection for the soil and for the overwintering insects. But if it's getting very deep and you've had to say, remove leaves from existing lawn to, to a more forested area, it may get kind of deep. And so some people may actually do a little bit of shredding of some of those leaves to reduce the quantity of them. And some leaves, of course, will be slower to break down. Those that are particularly leathery, like those of the Southern Magnolia, those are very slow to break down. So you might want to actually move those away. You'll learn about this if you watch that uh, Leave the Leaves video, but there are different things you can do as far as composting them as well to help some of them break down. And then someone else has a very leggy sweet bays in an area that floods fairly frequently. Should they cut it back or just propagate some seedlings? Now that is a species that can tolerate a certain amount of water. I mean, that tree is used sometimes in a large rain garden as the central feature of that rain garden. So I'm not sure how it's developed this more leggy look, but you could perhaps if you didn't like the legginess, encourage some of the moisture-loving shrubs underneath. Clethra alnifolia that I'll be getting to shortly would be a nice shrub that's quite often used in rain garden and those flooding type conditions. Lane, do you have a recommendation on how to tell if your soil is well-drained? We probably have some great information on that in our extension agents discussion of soil. We have a whole presentation on soil, but you can 
do different kinds of drainage tests where you dig a hole and you fill it with water and then you measure exactly how long it's taking for that water to disperse. If there's any further questions about that, maybe write to our help desk for a more thorough discussion of how to conduct those tests for drainage. Someone else is concerned that leaving the leaves will create more mold and fungus problems and more allergies in the spring. Is this warranted? I haven't particularly found that to be true, but I guess I tend to have dry shade, my leaves tend to dry out. I'll keep in mind a couple of the questions that have been asked about shrubs as we begin this very next section. I'll begin by describing a group of shrubs that will grow in dry to moist conditions and then move on uh, toward the end of this section, those that prefer moist to wet conditions. So Mount Laurel, Calmia latifolia, is really one of the most beautiful of our flowering shrubs. This grows all the way from Maine into the southeast, more uh, inland. It grows in most of Virginia, except for the coast. It's evergreen and multi-stemmed, growing anywhere from 5 to 20 feet tall. It likes part shade, and this is one example of a plant that really does well in dry soil as long as it's acidic. It prefers the pH of 4.5 to 6.5. It tolerates rocky soil, but not clay. Deer occasionally damage it, and it's a thicket-forming plant, and I think about seeing it when I've I've been driving, for example, along Skyline Drive. Some of those mountainous areas, it does really uh, tend to grow well in that uh, drier, rockier, sloping soil. Mount Laurel has lovely clusters of cup-shaped flowers in May, and these are going to provide both nectar and pollen for our native bees. Sometimes you'll see the flowers in shades of pink. Mount Laurel distributes its pollen in a very unusual way. The stamens are fastened here at each of these bright colored points, and they are spring loaded. So when insects land, uh, they will be released and the pollen will be dispersed onto the backs of the insects in order to be carried on to pollinate other plants. Mount Laurel has shiny evergreen leaves and a characteristic short and rather gnarled trunks. Uh, eventually, you'll see fruit that's enjoyed by the birds. This uh, particular shrub is an excellent complement for rhododendrons and azaleas that like the same types of growing conditions. And speaking of azaleas, our next shrub is Pinkster Bloom Azalea. Rhododendron periclimenoides. This is found all the way from coastal New England into the southeast and throughout every region in Virginia. It's multi-stemmed with a rounded form and horizontal branching and grows anywhere from three to six feet tall. It's going to grow in part to full shade, actually does best in filtered light. And again, it's going to prefer moist, rich, acidic soil with a pH anywhere from 4.5 to 5.5. Unfortunately, deer will frequently damage it. It can spread by a process referred to as suckering. It has shallow roots that benefit from a mulch of wood chips or pine needles. The leaves at the tips uh, may appear whirled. And these will provide nourishment for up to 50 different caterpillars of our butterflies and moths. Obviously, an outstanding feature is the showy fragrant flowers that bloom from April to May. And these attract a wide range of bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Pinkster bloom azalea is long-lived and easy to grow as long as it's well sited. And continuing with a third of the so-called ericaceous plants, those that like the acidic soil, we have great rhododendron, sometimes referred to as rose bay rhododendron, rhododendron maximum. This grows natively all the way from Maine to Alabama and Georgia in the southeast. In Virginia, it's found in the mountains and foothills, as well as in several counties in northern Virginia. Great rhododendron is evergreen and multi-stemmed, can range anywhere from 5 to 15 feet tall. It grows in part to full shade, 
and prefers moist, rich, acidic soil with a pH anywhere from 4.5 to 6.0. It tolerates full shade, but is intolerant of clay soil and so-called wet feet. So this is a plant that really likes the dry slopes again. Deer, unfortunately, may severely damage it and note that it is toxic to dogs, cats, and humans. Because of its evergreen foliage, it provides excellent winter and extreme weather cover for wildlife. Great rhododendron has leathery strap-like leaves. They are maybe about eight inches in length. And it has these sizable clusters of large funnel-shaped flowers, maybe even about two inches across from June to July. And these attract many pollinators, including swallowtail butterflies. And then seeds will be eaten by songbirds. Great rhododendron is especially effective in groups and it has great winter interest. So this could be another example of a plant that could be allowed to spread on dry slopes. Another lovely shrub is strawberry bush, also called Hearts of Buston, Euonymus americanus. It grows natively all the way from New Jersey through the Southeast and is found in the Piedmont and Coastal Plain in Virginia. It's a very airy, multi-stemmed plant, only four to six inches high. It prefers part shade conditions and moist soil, will tolerate clay soil and even full shade, although it's going to fruit best in light shade, and unfortunately a favorite of deer. This plant, because of its habit, is really an excellent replacement for invasive Nandina. Strawberry bush has these lovely, very subtle, small flowers from May to June. And this is followed by very showy late summer fruit. And the seeds are eaten by wintering birds. You'll see lovely dark red foliage in the fall. And this particular shrub is highly recommended as an understory shrub by Earth Sangha, our local conservation organization. Wild hydrangea, hydrangea arborescens, grows in the central part of the east, particularly the mountains and Piedmont in Virginia. It's mound shape and like Asian hydrangeas, it grows from unbranched canes. This particular species grows three to six feet in height. It grows in both part to full shade, likes moist soil, but deer may browse it. Now, wild hydrangea is very fast growing, and it's one of those plants that can be pruned hard. It can be cut almost close to the ground in late winter, and then it will rebound with up to three to five feet of growth, and it will flower in that same season on the new growth. Wild hydrangea has large quilted leaves, and these will provide food for a number of moth species. It has these large flat clusters of flowers. You'll particularly note all the little, little anthers of these fertile flowers. And you'll see these from May to June and they attract many pollinators, especially bumblebees, a great source of midsummer pollen and nectar. Now an alert, it's a good idea to avoid the showy cultivars of hydrangea arborescens, like this Annabelle cultivar that's pictured here. They're very attractive to us, but they consist basically of these showy sterile flowers, and they won't offer the pollen and nectar to support our pollinators. A great report on the various cultivars of wild hydrangea has been recently published by Mount Cuba up in Delaware, and I refer you to that for more information. I've provided a link on your handout. Wild hydrangea is lovely to be used either in shady mixed borders or in a woodland setting. Witch hazel, Hamamelis virginiana, is another very adaptable native shrub growing throughout much of the eastern United States, even west all the way to Arkansas and Louisiana, and found throughout all of the regions of Virginia. This is a multi-stemmed shrub uh, with an upright vase shape, can reach 15 to 20 feet in height. 
it can grow in a variety of sun exposures all the way from sun to full shade. It likes moist soil, tolerates heavy clay and erosion, sucker to form colonies. It's a larval host for up to 62 species of moths. Which hazel has lovely oval scallop leaves with a yellow to orange fall color. Its outstanding feature are the blooms. This is the latest blooming of our native shrubs, and you'll see these ribbon-like flowers in the late fall. They will continue on into the winter, and then when the ribbon-like petals fall off, you'll see these cup-like calyxes uh, persisting into the spring. Witch hazel can be used because of its larger size, either as a specimen plant, or it can make a really nice hedge. Spice bush, Lindera benzoin, is sometimes referred to as the forsythia of the wilds because of its early spring bloom. This is found throughout much of the east, somewhat less in the southeast, and it's native to all regions of Virginia. It has a broad rounded habit, six to 16 feet in height. This is another dioecious species with separate male and female plants. It can grow in a range of sun exposures, but it grows best in part shade. It likes moist soil, and luckily deer will seldom severely damage it. I think this has to do with the aromatic qualities of the plant. It's the larval host for two species of swallowtail butterflies and the Promethea moth. You'll see fragrant flowers on spice bush beginning in March, and as I mentioned, will be on separate male and female plants. The male flowers will have these pairs of anthers, and then the female flowers will have the single white-tipped pistil. Spice bush has very nutritious fruit that's rich in lipids that help support bird migration in the fall. And we can make use of the foliage for tea and these fruits used as a ground spice, something like allspice. Spice bush has aromatic yellow fall foliage, and it's most effective when naturalized in a woodland setting. American beautyberry, Calicarpa americana, grows uh, from the Virginia coastal plain further into the southeast all the way to eastern Texas. This has a vase shape with distinctly arching branches, reaches anywhere from three to six feet in height. It grows in sun to part shade and is intolerant of deep shade. It won't flower and fruit under that condition. It likes moist soil, be alert that deer may damage it. American beautyberry has very large, wide, toothed leaves. They can be up to eight inches long. And interestingly, these are now being studied as a potential insect repellent. There's a chemical property referred to as Kelly Carpinol that's being investigated. You'll see these lovely pastel flowers from June to August that attract both bees and butterflies. But the outstanding feature of American Beautyberry, of course, are these brilliant magenta droops. That's a, a technical term for this type of fruit that has a little stone inside. You'll see those in September, and those are enjoyed by over 40 species of songbirds. American Beautyberry is especially effective when used in naturalized landscapes, and it does its best fruiting when it's planted in a group. Now, some of you may experience what happened to me when I attempted to buy an American beauty berry. And that is the confusion between the native species and the non-native Japanese species. So in order to help you distinguish between them, I'd like to show you a few features. As I mentioned, the American beauty berry has these very large wide leaves. The Japanese species has longer more lance-shaped leaves. They're considerably smaller. In addition, the flowers, although they're a similar color, are just located along the top level of the stem rather than completely surrounding the stem. And then the fruit similarly is located just along the top 
rather than completely surrounding the stem. And it should be correctly identified as Calicarpa japonica. Now that is the last of the shrubs for dry to moist conditions. And I have now four to describe that like moist to wet conditions. The first is Virginia sweet spire, Itea virginica. It grows in New Jersey and Delaware, and then along the coastal plain and in Northern Virginia, in the state of Virginia, and then further down into the Southeast. It has an arching to rounded habit, reaches six to 10 feet in height. It can grow in either sun or part shade, and it likes moist humus rich soil. It tolerates clay soil, flooding up to six inches, and even dense shade. It is luckily deer resistant. It's one of those shrubs that is particularly prone to suckering. And I'll discuss this in a little more detail in a moment. There are actually quite a number of shorter cultivars available. One of the popular ones is Henry's Garnet that reaches maybe about four to five feet in height and little Henry that grows about three to four feet in height. This uh, shrub provides great nesting and cover for birds. Virginia sweet spire has these lovely lustrous leaves and they take on this flaming fall color that make them a fabulous a replacement for burning bush. You'll see buds. I'm beginning to see these here in mid-April on my shrubs. And then they will be followed by these drooping flower clusters from May to June. These are very attractive for bees and butterflies, as well as our native wasps that will be coming to seek nectar. And then these fruit capsules will be on the plant from June all the way into March. And those seeds will be eaten by birds. Virginia sweet spire is effective either as an accent plant because of those beautiful flowers or because of its tendency to do that suckering, it can very easily, very quickly form a delightful hedge. Possum haw by Burnham Newdom grows along the entire East Coast and down along the Gulf Coast as far as Eastern Texas. This is multi-stemmed and another spreading plant. Uh, reaches five to 12 feet in height. It can grow in sun to part shade and is another one that likes moist to wet acidic soil. It tolerates a, a wide range of soil types. Deer may browse the twigs and the leaves. This particular shrub provides great cover and nesting sites and it's also the larval host for many caterpillars including that of the spring azure butterfly. Possum haw, like all of the native viburnums, has flowers in these wide flat top clusters, and you'll see those from May to June, and bees will come visiting to seek pollen. Uh, it has the glossiest of all of the viburnum leaves, lustrous and somewhat leathery, and they take on a stunning fall color. And accompanying that fall color, you'll see this lovely multicolored fruit that will ripen all the way from July on into the fall, and that is enjoyed by birds. This is a very high value shrub with multi-season interest. Sweet pepper bush, also called summer sweet, is Clethra alnifolia. That's found natively along the coast from Maine all the way around to Eastern Texas, and especially in the coastal plain in Virginia. It has a rounded form, can grow from six to 12 feet high. It can grow in the sun, but also in the shade conditions we're discussing today. It likes moist to wet soil, tolerates clay, dense shade, and even salt to some extent. This is one that deer seldom severely damage. It offers lovely cover and nesting sites. And there are some shorter cultivars available. Hummingbird is just one of them. Sweet pepper bush is very attractive because of its scented flowers. And it is one of those shrubs that will be blooming in the summertime uh, from July to August. Very attractive for our bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. One uh, especially popular uh, pink flowering cultivar is ruby spice. 
then you'll see these fruit capsules from September all the way to January, and those provide food for birds and mammals. Sweet pepper bush has lovely quilted foliage that takes on a bright fall color. And it's especially enjoyable when planted as a hedge near seeding areas because of those scented flowers. And the last of our native shrubs for today is winterberry Ilex verticillata, growing throughout eastern North America, mainly north of Virginia, although it is found throughout every region in Virginia. This is a deciduous holly with a rounded form, 6 to 12 feet in height. It is another one of the dioecious species. It can grow in sun as well as in part shade likes moist, wet soil, tolerates clay and air pollution. Deer may occasionally damage it, provides great cover for birds. Winterberry has quilted foliage. And as I mentioned, it's dioecious. So you'll see flowers on separate male and female plants from June to July, which are very attractive to the native bees. Pictured here are female flowers, which have a green rounded center to them. And on the male flowers, you'll definitely see the pollen on the anthers. Now, because it's dioecious, you'll want to match named cultivars of this particular plant. So winterberry will have a female cultivars, such as red sprite, which would be matched with the male Jim Dandy. There is an orange fruited variety, winter gold, that's matched with Southern Gentleman. So you want to make sure that these are blooming at the same time. Then the pollinated female flowers will produce fruit. You'll see that from August into September, and they provide food for a wide number of our native bird species. When you're planting them, you can plant at least one male with multiple female shrubs. They can be planted side by side as pictured here. And as long as they're within 40 feet of each other, the pollen can be carried from the male to the female shrubs. On your handout, I've listed some other shrubs you might want to consider. Uh, these are southeastern species natively, but they grow well here. And again, you can follow the links to learn more about those. Do we have any questions at this point, Colleen? Yes, we uh, have uh, actually quite a few. People are asking how far away from canopy or understory trees should shrubs be planted? I guess what's too close? Understory trees, uh, in my yard, for example, I have an understory tree kind of equidistant from a tall tulip poplar and a sweet gum, maybe 15 feet away from those. And the shrubs, you don't want them right up against the trunk, but I would say within maybe about five feet of the trunk, if, if they're not going to be eventually expanding up next to it, as long as you're installing them small, so they're not going to be disturbing those roots. If you're creating very wide beds and you're concerned about the roots of the tree, maybe plant them further away, 10 or 15 feet away from the trunk of the tree. A couple of questions on dioecious plants. One was how to tell which sex you have. And I know you have a couple of nice slides on female and male, but is there any way to tell the sex before they bloom? Not really, unless the plants are labeled. In the case of the, uh, the winterberry, the Ilex verticillata, um, those cultivars are going to be named. And as long as you know which names correspond to male and female plants, you can tell just by the naming. If you shop from a nursery that specializes in native plants, they will recognize the importance of the sexing and they may try to do that. Um, ideally, you could try to buy them during the time that they might be flowering. If you refer to a presentation I gave earlier this year, which is now available on the website, caring for your native plants garden. I go into a lot of detail and show specific examples of what the flowers look like for a lot of different shrubs. If you were to check in the fall, you might see fruiting on some of the female shrubs, but just because a shrub isn't fruiting doesn't mean it's male. It could be male or it could be a young female that hasn't fruited. 
So check that earlier presentation if you'd like to see more close-up examples with actual photos for some of the different species. And a related question, how close do dioecious plants have to be to each other? As I mentioned for the winter berry, as long as they're within about 40 feet, the pollen can be carried from one to the other. Okay, there was a specific question on winter berry. Someone has a set of shrubs that are losing their leaves except at the tip and very little fruit production, although they have a male and female. Is there any thought you have about what could be the problem? I don't know if it's maybe not getting quite enough light to photosynthesize and then flower and produce the fruit. That might be a good help desk question. Any of the questions that I don't answer thoroughly now, I'll be looking into these questions and then I'll provide an addendum document sent out to everyone. Okie doke, great. Um, and finally, the same person who asked about shrubs for a dry slope mentioned that the two choices seem to be laurel and rhododendron, both of which are toxic to animals and children. Is there any other possibility for a dry slope in the shade? As you'll note on your handout, I've mentioned a number of other shrubs besides those. The spice bush or the witch hazel could spread really nicely. And because of that thicketing, they would be very helpful in holding the soil and preventing erosion on the slope. So maybe look at those. There have been a couple of questions about what does native mean? What does cultivar mean? I have a very detailed discussion about that in the talk I referred to, but basically native plants are those that are found within a certain region. They're so-called native to that region. They're found there without having been planted there. They've evolved there with the flora and fauna for a, a long period of time. Cultivars are those that are manipulated by horticulturalists, by nurseries. They're selected for certain characteristics and they go through a careful process of breeding. And it's particularly of concern with the woody plants that are more likely to be propagated vegetatively by cloning. That means that all the plants are absolutely identical rather than being reproduced sexually. So there won't be as much variation. Other issues with cultivars have to do with the change of foliage color for shrubs where they won't serve any longer as host plants. It's uh, the change in flower color and shape for the herbaceous plants that's problematic because they may not have all the reproductive flower parts and they can't provide pollen and nectar. We're going to be looking at some woodland wildflowers and I'll begin by mentioning two that are ephemerals. That means plants that are going to come out and provide lovely color for you very early before the canopy leaves in. I've given a whole talk on ephemerals and you'll be able to see even more plants if you follow the link for that at the end of the talk. So the first of these is Virginia bluebells, Mertensia virginica. I've chosen this one because it just grows so easily. It can be found from New York to Virginia, plus Tennessee, and even a little further west. It's erect and clump forming, 12 to 30 inches high, grows in part to full shade, and likes moist, wet soil. Tolerant of deer, rabbits, and black walnut, not so tolerant of waterlogged soil in winter. And as I mentioned, it will go dormant in the summer. It can provide, however, seasonal cover for wildlife. It begins emerging with these purple leaves and then they will turn green. They're large and floppy. You'll see multicolored buds and bell-shaped flowers for three weeks. They're just finishing up now here in April. They'll attract bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. And you'll sometimes see color variants. The nuts with seeds will appear in the summer. And this is a very attractive plant when interplanted with ferns that can uh, fill in once the foliage has died back. A second ephemeral is large flowered bellwort found in New England from Pennsylvania down to North Carolina and even points further west. It's clump forming 18 to 24 inches high in part to full shade. The foliage, as I've mentioned, may die back in hot weather and deer may also damage it. Interestingly, the young shoots are sometimes eaten as a substitute for asparagus. 
the lance-shaped leaves are referred to as perfoliate. That means that it appears that the stem is actually piercing the leaves. It has these lovely nodding bell-shaped flowers, very attractive to our native bees. And it can spread to form lovely colonies, which will bring you beautiful spring color. Moving on to perennials that will be with you throughout the growing season in your shady garden. Wild columbine, Aquilegia canadensis, found from Maine to Virginia. Erect and branching, anywhere from a short six inches up to 36 inches tall. Grows in sun to part shade and dry to moist soil. Deer seldom severely damage this. This is not to be confused with the non-native common columbine, Equilegia vulgaris. You'll see this in shades of pink and purple and, and even multicolored. Our native species has compound lobed leaves and these lovely nodding spurred flowers. They are always red with the yellow centers, attracting a, a wide number of pollinators. This is a short-lived plant, but it self-seeds very easily to form colonies, and it is often found cropping up in paths and cracks. You can use it, obviously, in your woodland garden, but you may find it moving by seed to some other sunny spots. Blue-stemmed goldenrod, Solidago casea, uh, grows again throughout much of the East Coast, clump forming with arching stems two to three feet high, it can grow in sun, but does equally well in part shade as long as it has uh, three hours of sun for flowering. It can grow in dry to moist soil and even tolerates dry shade. It spreads by self-seeding and rhizomes, but not aggressively. Now, this is a top herbaceous host genius, the solidago, very important for supporting the caterpillars of our moths and butterflies. And additionally, this plant provides cover and nesting sites. You'll see it beginning here with the basal growth in March, and then you'll see lance-shaped leaves on bluish stems in June. Lovely daisy-like flowers from late summer into the fall will attract many pollinators, and then birds will be able to use the seeds. So this is a high value shade plant for wildlife. Solomon seal, Polygonatum biflorum, is a mounding plant with arching unbranched stems, one to three feet in height. It likes both part to full shade, dry to moist soil, be alert for deer. This is uh, another plant that can spread, but it's going to do it somewhat slowly to form colonies. Now, you may uh, often see available in garden centers this species with variegated foliage. This is non-native. This is Polygonatum odoratum from Asia. Our native species has dangling flowers. Uh, to my eye, they seem fuller than those of the Asian species. You'll see these from April to June, very attractive to butterflies, and then blue to black berries dangling underneath. It takes on a bright fall color and a nice plant to mix with ferns at the base of trees. Woodland phlox is one of many of our native phlox species. This one is Phlox de Viricata. It's a mat forming evergreen plant, nine to 18 inches tall, and be alert that deer and rabbits may damage it. It has lance-shaped uh, pubescent leaves and then these loose, flat clusters of flowers that attract both hummingbirds and butterflies. It spreads to form colonies, so just a lovely woodland ground cover. Wild geranium, geranium maculatum, is a clump-forming plant, 18 to 24 inches high, can grow in sun, but obviously in part shade as well. It tolerates a clay soil and drought, Deer may occasionally damage it. This can spread again by rhizomes, but not aggressively. This is another of what Doug Tellamy, the entomologist, refers to as a keystone species because it uh, provides support for quite a few species of uh, our Lepidoptera. While geranium has palmate lobed leaves, these lovely five petaled flowers from April to July that attract bees, native flies, and butterflies. It's sometimes referred to as cranesbill, and you can see why. The seeds will form 
and be dispersed from this beak-like fruit, and uh, that opens very explosively. This is a nice plant to use under trees, especially white oak in woodlands. Great blue lobelia, Lobelia syphilitica, has thick, rigid, erect stems, can grow quite tall, up to five feet in either sun or part shade. This one definitely likes moist to wet soil and can tolerate heavy shade. Luckily, deer seldom severely damage it. And again, it's a plant that may self-seed to form colonies. It begins growth from a basal rosette and then will send up these unbranched leafy stems and they will be topped by these racemes from August to October. Great plant for use either in woodlands or near ponds and streams. I believe this is the last of our wildflowers, white turtlehead, Chelone glabra, a clump forming plant with stout erect stems, one to four feet tall. This can grow in sun as well as shade and is another one that likes moist to wet soil, even tolerates flooding. Deer may damage this one. Now it gets tall enough that it may need staking if it's planted in excess shade. So you may want to use the technique of pinching it back to control its legginess. White turtle head has sharply toothed leaves and it serves as the larval host for the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. It has hooded two-lipped flowers. You can see how it gets the name turtle head. You'll see these from July into October and they attract a wide number of pollinators followed by ovoid seed capsules, a great plant to use either in a woodland or near water. Now we could spend an entire hour talking about ferns. In fact, I recently gave a talk and I'm going to provide a link for that. Ferns are just a wonderful plant to use in your shady garden. They're not flowering, but they're going to provide wonderful texture. And I'm going to give you some highlights on the ferns here. They are of different growth habits. The first ferns shown right here are clumping ferns. The clumps will get larger, but they won't spread by rhizomes. Ebony spleenwort is a rather narrow vase-shaped fern, has low fronds at the bottom that are recumbent, and then these taller fronds, about 20 inches tall. Marginal wood fern is very attractive with very lacy fronds, about two to three feet high and wide, and it has these very interesting arrangements of sori, the reproductive parts, to disperse the spores on the back. And then Christmas fern is noted for its very deep color to its fronds. It's called Christmas fern because of the little lobes that are at the base of the fronds that look something like Christmas stockings. Now, all three of these clumping ferns are evergreen. So they'll be in your garden all year round and they all can grow in dry shade. Moving into the slow spreading ferns, the first is maidenhair fern. It has a very unusual growth habit. It has black stalks and then the fronds are held horizontally like this in kind of a fan-like pattern. It has very attractive frilly pinnae, the little leaflets set against the dark black of the stems. Interrupted fern is interesting because it has the spore bearing structures located intermittently along the stems. Cinnamon fern, a very dramatic with the cinnamon colored fertile fronds that are in the center. And it's unusual in that it can take on this lovely fall color. Royal fern is one of the tallest of our ferns, can reach even six feet tall in ideal conditions, and it has these very interesting bead-like clusters of sporangia, the spore-bearing structures. All of these can grow in moist conditions, and they will spread slowly, maybe a number of inches or so over a year. And finally, we have the fast-spreading ferns. They could grow perhaps even a foot a year. Now, hay-scented fern can grow in dry conditions, and it's the most aggressive of the ferns. It can spread quite a bit. All of the others grow in moist to wet conditions. Lady fern has very delicate 
fronds set against the red central stalk. Ostrich fern is by far the largest of the ferns, can reach about six feet in height and as much as eight feet across. And it's interesting in that even though these sterile fronds, the green fronds will fade, it will continue to have the interest through the winter with these fertile fronds that will then release the spores in the spring. And finally, sensitive fern lives up to its name. It's sensitive to heat, to drought, and to the first frost in the fall. It's interesting in that it has lobed fronds and will also have these fertile fronds that last through into the spring. Some quick points on landscaping with ferns. A plant like ostrich fern is beautiful backlit when planted with bulbs. Christmas fern is great when grouped for erosion control. A tall fern like royal fern is great as a backdrop plant. Cinnamon fern is a beautiful dramatic tall specimen and marginal wood fern is a lovely wide spreading specimen. You can use any of the fast spreading ferns like ostrich fern as a ground cover and a slower spreading fern like maidenhair would be very attractive grouped underneath shrubs. Sensitive fern has really interesting contrasting texture. You can even have a mixed grouping of different types of ferns and either the slow spreading or the clumping ferns could be very attractive as an edging for a pathway. <clears throat> And marginal wood fern I use interplanted with the ephemerals in my garden. When those die back, then it will continue to linger on as an evergreen plant. All right, uh, grasses and sedges are also lovely plants to add interest and uh, different textures in your garden. We quite often think of the plants that like the sun, like switchgrass, Indian grass, little blue stem. But here are three cool season grasses that are lovely for shade. Wavy hair grass grows especially well in part shade where there's just enough light to catch those lovely seed heads at the tip and it grows in dry to moist soil. Bottle brush grass grows anywhere from sun to full shade in dry to moist soil. It has these very large, almost bamboo-like leaves and very interesting seed heads. River oats grows again from sun to part shade and dry to wet soil and has lovely oat-like seed heads that are beautiful when they're backlit and they will change color through the seasons. River oats is the most aggressive as far as spreading. So you wanna be careful about citing that if you have any, any concerns about fast spreading plants. Bottle brush grass will seed somewhat, but it's very easy to lift and move around if you don't like where it's landed. Sedges are great plants, both for dry and moist shade. These particular ones are good for dry conditions. Pennsylvania sedge, Carex pennsylvanica, will spread fairly quickly by rhizomes and can then create this very soft wavy texture to your ground layer. It has interesting inflorescences in the spring. Appalachian sedge has similar grass-like foliage, but it has more substantial tufts, about six inches high and as much as a foot across. Plant and leaf sedge is really one of the most dramatic. It has blades that are about an inch across, crinkly giving it its alternate name of seersucker sedge, and really dramatic seed heads, inflorescences with alternating maroon and lime green stalks. And then a few sedges for moist to wet shade. Gray sedge is quite dramatic with these mace-like seed structures. Blue wood sedge is lovely with blue-green foliage. And creek sedge is another great choice for moist to wet shade. As far as landscaping with grasses and sedges, a grass like the bottle brush grass will spread nicely, but not overly aggressively to create a lovely screen or backdrop. Appalachian sedge with its definite tufts is excellent as an edging or green mulch under your shrubs. Pennsylvania sedge, as I mentioned, spreads by rhizomes. So it could be a great turf replacement in deep shade where the turf grasses just won't grow. 
Gray sedge is, of course, a lovely accent plant. Plantain leaf sedge is really attractive when grouped. And it, to my mind, it's the perfect replacement for invasive liriope. And Creek sedge can be combined with other shade loving plants as a lovely ground cover for erosion control. Finally, speaking of ground covers, uh, these are the plants that are going to be really important for giving you that protection, that, that natural cover for this soil. They're going to be a lovely green mulch. And the ones I'm discussing will also have the interest during certain seasons of lovely flowers as well. So these are three deciduous ground covers. The first are violets. These can just volunteer in your yard. I don't have any grass, so I let these grow and multiply, and then I move them around to make quite distinctive ground cover. They're available uh, different species in different colors. Wild ginger has lovely satiny heart-shaped leaves. It's just beginning to leaf out now. And then tucked underneath will be these charming maroon colored flowers. White wood aster will grow a little bit taller with these shiny leaves. And then this will provide lovely late season pollen and nectar on the flower stalks, which are topped by daisy-like white flowers. Most of these ground covers that I'm discussing tend to grow in the full range of part to full shade and moist soil. But white wood aster is a good example of a plant that can take uh, dry conditions. Continuing with several more deciduous ground covers, lovely foam flower has heart-shaped leaves, and sometimes you'll see a darker veination on the central part. This particular plant likes to be kept evenly moist, so not too wet, not too dry, and it's noted for its lovely airy flowers. They're very prominent in my garden now here about the third week of April. For a completely different ground cover texture, we have wild stone crop. This has succulent leaves, grows best in part shade to provide enough light for these lovely star-shaped white flowers. This is quite low growing, just a few inches high. And then we have Jacob's Ladder, a little taller with these ladder-like leaves and lovely bluish purple flowers. And then I have a number of evergreen ground covers to recommend. Allegheny Spurge, Pachycandra procumbens, is the perfect replacement for the invasive Japanese Pachycandra, Pachycandra terminalis. In early spring, you'll see these charming pink and white flowers. Then new growth will come up. It will originally be mottled, a kind of a silvery purple, and then will turn this uh, more solid green. Golden ragwort has these lovely evergreen basal leaves. And in April, it will send up tall flower stalks with these yellow flowers that are very popular with the pollinators. Now, golden ragwort is highly recommended by our local Audubon at home program because it can grow all the way from sun to full shade and even somewhat dry to moist or wet soil. Green and gold also can tolerate a wide range of sun conditions. And the more sun it has, the more moisture you'll want to provide, but it does very well in part to full shade. And right now in April, you'll see these lovely five petaled yellow flowers. They will continue on for a bit and the plant can even bloom intermittently into the fall. And finally, partridge berry, again, a very low growing evergreen plant with lovely paired white flowers. You'll see these in May and then eventually these fruits in the fall. A ground cover vine you might want to consider is Virginia creeper. Some people get confused between Virginia creeper and poison ivy, so I'll point out that the native plant, the Virginia creeper, has palmate leaves, like the fingers of your hand, five leaves, whereas poison ivy has three leaves. And Virginia creeper can be used to stabilize banks, replacing English ivy. A few suggestions on landscaping with ground covers. White wood aster would make a nice border for a path. As I mentioned, I allow 
the violets to grow as a carpet underneath my shrubs. Allegheny spurge is my go-to for green mulch under trees. Golden ragwort can help fill open spaces with its lovely spring flowers. While ginger is just one of the ground covers that's great for covering a slope. Foam flower is especially attractive when climbing over rocks. Green and gold with its bright flowers, of course, adds lovely seasonal color. And wild stone crop, a very low plant, is excellent for edging a bed. Really quickly, I'll mention some resources. I've provided a link to our website suggestion list, and this will be taking you to all of the fact sheets that I've already provided links for on your handout. These recap all of the points I've made about the plants. They have additional photos, and many of them will be accompanied by videos that show you pollinators in action. For further information, we invite you to visit our Master Gardener virtual classroom and we'll provide links to how to get there. And you can review all of these talks that I've given that go into even more detail on plants that I haven't been able to cover today. I've referred to the uh, Mount Cuba plant trials for wild hydrangea. The most recent of their plant trials was on carex species, the lovely sedges. So I invite you to look at those. They can be found online. I had fun looking at these two books by Rick Dark and Doug Tallamy for inspiration, and they give lots of wonderful photos, detailed descriptions of how to use the plants and their support for wildlife. If you're local, we invite you to visit our Master Gardener demonstration gardens. The, obviously, the best one would be our Quarry Shade Garden, but even if you can't visit the gardens online, you can see our plant lists tips for planting in shade, and wonderful articles written by the coordinators of that garden. Three other gardens, a Glen Carlin, our small space garden, and Simpson Park Garden have portions of the garden that are dedicated to native shade plants. Locally, some public gardens you might want to visit are Meadowlark Botanical Gardens, Fern Valley at U.S. National Arboretum, and the Azalea Garden at Brookside Gardens. And a little further afield, the Nature Walk at Ledoux Topiary Gardens in Maryland, Virginia Native Plant Garden down at Norfolk, the March Bank area at Winterthur, and the Forest District at Longwood Gardens. And finally, where to buy plants. If you're local to the Northern Virginia area, I recommend checking out Plant Nova Natives for both native only year round sellers and particular plant sales that are going on now in the spring. If you are located elsewhere in Virginia, check out the website of Virginia Native Plant Society. I've also provided the link for the Maryland Native Plant Society. And if you're attending today from another state, just check out your own state Native Plant Society. They're likely to have links for nurseries and plant sales. And now I'm ready to take any final questions. One person asked a, a question about their bluebells, which are flopping over and not naturalizing. Is there any likely problem with that story? They just get floppy. <laughs> they, they'll get floppy after, the, after they've done their blooming. Hmm. Mine spread from just a few plants to what you saw in that one picture. So I'm not quite sure if they're just not getting the right conditions in order to spread. A question about whether there's a need to cut back ferns. You would cut back the uh, deciduous ferns, the, the non-evergreen ferns, at the end of the growing season. That would allow the new stalks to come up. I find that my evergreen ferns, the fronds will stay erect for a while, and then they'll kind of droop down. And then in the spring, you could just simply cut those dried stalks away to allow the new fiddleheads to come through. How much foot traffic can Pennsylvania sedge take? It can't really take a lot of foot traffic. So what I recommend is if you want to use it as kind of a turf replacement, as long as you don't have children that are going to be playing on it or dogs that are going to be romping over it, if you just want to have it 
as a kind of a ground cover. I would suggest using stepping stones as your area for foot traffic, and that way people can be stepping on those and the plants themselves would remain undisturbed. Is there a way to propagate shrubs using suckers? Yes. A perfect example is Virginia sweet spire, Itea virginica. That is one that is quick to sucker, and you can actually trim off the new growth that will come up from the base, and you can actually stick it in soil, keep it watered, and it will root fairly easily, and you can multiply your plants that way, either to share with others or move them around to different parts of your garden. If you want it to form a hedge, I would just let the suckers uh, continue where they are in place. Do you have specific suggestions for plants to grow in rock walls in the shade? One of the best is ebony spleenwort that I mentioned. And let me respond to that in my addendum with some more very specific suggestions after I have a moment or two to think about that. Okay, Elaine, I think that covers it. This was really a wonderful presentation and we all thank you. Well, I've enjoyed pulling this information together. I wish you all happy gardening and I hope maybe you've been inspired to learn a little bit more about uh, some of these plants and use them in your own gardens.